This episode of CPP Cast is sponsored by Backtrace, the turnkey debugging platform that helps you spend less time debugging and more time building. Get to the root cause quickly with detailed information at your fingertips. Start your free trial at backtrace.io slash cppcast. And by JetBrains, maker of intelligent development tools to simplify your challenging tasks and automate the routine ones. JetBrains is offering a 25% discount for an individual license on the C++ tool of your choice, C-Lion, ReSharp, or C++, or AppCode. Use the coupon code JetBrains for CPPCast during checkout at JetBrains.com. Episode 119 of CPPCast with guest Josh Peterson, recorded September 20th, 2017. In this episode, we talk about C++ user groups around the world and GCC warnings. Then we talk to Josh Peterson from Unity 3D. Josh talks to us about C Sharp and IL to CPP. Welcome to episode 119 of CPP Cast, the only podcast for C developers by C developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good, Rob. How are you doing? Doing good. You have a little chaos going on at your house right now, though, right? Yes, my, my house is currently being inspected by a team of 25 um, home inspection students. Uh, we volunteered it for that. But on a side, you know, not related to my house being inspected at the moment, is I have been like, I really wanted to hit the goal of getting 10,000 subscribers for C++ Weekly before mm-hmm. CBPCon this year. At this exact moment, I'm at 9,999. So hopefully okay. I will actually get past 10,000 subscribers. So by the time this episode airs, hopefully you've hit that. But if not, and you're listening and you haven't subscribed to C++ Weekly, go, uh, go check out the YouTube channel. I think that sounds like a great plan. <laughs> well, I, I get like 15 subscribers a day on average, new subscribers a day. Okay. So I really expect like I, you know, by the end of the episode to be at 10,000, but it's an exciting moment for me. So I thought I'd share it. Yeah. 10,000 is a lot and uh, you got there pretty quickly, it seems. Uh, well, might feel that way to you. <laughs> <laughs> How it's many 80, are you on now? 83 episodes, 83 weeks I've oh. been doing it straight. Okay. Well, at the top of your episode, I'd like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, this week, we got an email from Harold, who is one of the organizers for the Sweden C++ user group. And he wrote in to tell us about this uh, joint uh, user group meeting, um, a distributed user group meeting between the Sweden C++ group and the London C++ group, which is pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, I guess in London and, and in Sweden, Stockholm, where the two groups meet, uh, the company King has a headquarters in both locations or building in both locations. So they're ha- holding the meetup and they're going to basically take turns presenting content. So London will present some, Sweden will present some, and, and the other group will be watching it online, which is pretty cool. Yeah. And since I guess there's an hour time difference between the two of them, they're doing like one of them's doing lunch at the front or dinner at the front end. And one's doing the dinner at the back end or something like that. That looks like like a neat, uh, neat setup. Yeah. I'm not sure if they're broadcasting any of the content to people outside of the user group, um, or if it's meant just to be for the people in the user group. But if you're in London or Sweden, if you're not regularly going to this user group already, it's probably worth checking out. Yeah. And that's October 26th. It looks like. Yes. Well, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show as well. You can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email us at feedback at cpcast.com. And don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes. Joining us today is Josh Peterson. Josh is a programmer working at Unity Technologies, where he focuses on integration and development of scripting runtimes for the Unity 3D game engine. He enjoys learning about CPU architectures and assembly language, including the recent development of an MOS 6510 emulator in C-sharp. In his free time, he coaches a number of youth soccer teams and reads philosophy and theology. Josh, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Interesting that you specifically call out the 6510 version. 
Yes, I'm not. Uh, I'm probably not as versed in all the versions as you are, but I guess 6510 oh. was maybe a little more memory than 6502, right? Is there another difference? I'm not sure. Uh, the 65, as far as I know, the only difference is that the 6510 has uh, an I/O port on it. Oh, okay. Yeah, there, there's there's plenty of people who know the MOS, yeah. uh, those processors much better than I do, but I thought it would be a fun one to try to write an emulator for. I know there's at least three people listening to this podcast when it airs <laughs> who would correct us on everything that we just said. But uh, Please do, because I'd like to know more. Do you have a specific goal for a system that you want to emulate, or just the CPU? Uh, I do. Um, I'd like to put together something for uh, kind of playing with assembly language or learning assembly language. And I thought the uh, you know the assembly language for the MOS sixty five you know hundred series is pretty simple. Yeah, and it's a CPU that I could write an emulator for. And uh, I know there's already some out there too. I think there's at least one website that does it in JavaScript, and you can actually type in the assembly code and kind of see it execute. So I had something like that in mind, but uh, we'll see. Yeah, I actually used that JavaScript sixty five hundred two website when I was preparing for my CPP con talk last year. It was it was handy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really nice. So. So, but it was it was fun writing the emulator. I learned a lot about uh, sixty five hundred two and CPUs in general. So, yeah, um, my cousin uh, is one of his hobbies is every time he picks up a new language or a new system is to port his Nintendo emulator to it. <laughs> so he has done one, I believe, in C sharp and in TypeScript and Rust and C at this point. Wow! And that's the the eight bit Nintendo. Yeah, so that yes. would be a, that, that a 6502, 6, right? Yeah. yeah, which is why I brought it up. So yeah, so yeah, maybe I don't fully understand the 6510 to 6502 distinction, but uh, hopefully someone will help me out. It's, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it's no reason to get into the weeds there. I can think of this anyhow. I'm not sure. <laughs> I would have to look to double check. <laughs> Okay, Josh. Well, we got a couple news articles to discuss. Uh, feel free to comment on any of these, and then we'll start talking to you more about uh, the work you're doing at Unity and C Sharp and, and IL2 CPP, okay? Okay. Okay. Uh, so this first article uh, is this paper about energy efficiency across programming languages. Uh, how does energy, time, and memory relate? And I don't know about you guys, but I didn't read the whole paper, but I did browse through the set of results a little bit. And was happy to see that C++ is always at the top of the chart. Um, not the very top. Usually uh, C, C++, and Rust are, are kind of grouped in the top three positions between the different tests that they ran through. Yeah, I find this slightly confusing, personally. Because I know, I, I read somewhere else that they based all this on the language shootout um comparisons. So, I mean, there's already a suite of these tests for all these different languages, right? So they were able to run them. They didn't have to write their own suite of tests. So right. I expected to see a direct correlation between wall clock time and and power usage, but that's not what you see. Hmm. So, like, looking at the binary tree comparison, C++ is actually one of the slower ones, but again, they're using someone else's thing. It's 63 seconds, even though it took, it was only the second and the amount of CPU usage, or excuse me, and uh, power usage. Yeah, I don't quite understand the difference there. Yeah. That seems to be what we find a lot with, especially on mobile platforms, so, you know, the code that actually executes faster is better for energy, right, because there's fewer instructions, Right. I do recall, it's probably maybe five years ago, I think Herb Sutter gave a talk about kind of the future of C++. I don't know if you guys remember this. I think it was right after CPP 11, C++ 11, but um, about how languages would be judged based on something like performance per watt, mm -hmm. I think is what he said. And uh, I don't know, it seems like this, you know, this sort of analysis indicates that's, you know, becoming more and more the case with, you know, mobiles and... Uh, data centers and whatnot, but yeah. languages which are energy efficient you know, can be really beneficial. So we don't want to be running all of our high-performance computations with Ruby or Perl, it <laughs> looks like. If I, if I were to take a quick glance at all of the bottom of the rankings across these tests. Yeah. Python's really pretty low down there, too. Yeah. Oh. Interpreted languages without any sort of runtime or compile time optimization or anything, you know? Yep. Okay, uh, next one. Jason, you were actually a part of this, the C++ World Cafe. 
I was. And we're just talking about that distributed user group. This seems like kind of a, a similar thing, a, a user group happening online. Am I right? Well, no, it was kind of the inverse in a way, uh, I guess. Okay. They had their user group that was meeting uh, in Germany, and they had the four of us call in to people running Skype on their laptops. So we okay. were just four, specifically four individuals joining in uh, with this one user group. And, um, you know, I didn't interact with any of the other people who called in. I was just interacting with the table that I was at. Oh, it was interesting, but it was a lot of fun actually from my perspective because uh, apparently I was just available to keep chatting. So I just I just stayed on the line with them for I don't know over an hour or something and just got the chance to just chat with some of our C plus plus users in Germany and talk to them about their experiences learning C plus plus and stuff. I had a great time doing it. Cool. And your topic was how can I become a better C plus plus developer? It looks yes. like. And I saw there, there's a transcript of the conversation that all, all you and the other three guests were having. Uh, is it not recorded, though? Is it just the transcript? Um, I th thought, oops, uh, I thought that there was a, going to be a video posted also, but it's been actually a while ago that we did this. It took him, you know, understandably, yeah, June 14th, took him a while to go through and, like, organize everything and type out all the transcripts and double-check it for errors and whatever. But I agree, right. I don't see a link to the video, so that must not have gone up. Okay. Well, I really like the idea of these kind of online user groups and distributed user groups. Uh, you know, just more ways to bring the community together. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then the last one we have today is useful GCC warning options not enabled by WALL and WXtra. And I thought a couple of these warnings were uh, seemed to be pretty useful. It definitely seems like uh, you know maybe they should be included in WALL WXtra. I don't know who makes that decision. I just, I mean, I find it ridiculous that there's this flag called all, which yeah. is not all. And then there's a flag called extra, which is more than all, but still not all. But, you know, it's historical. They don't want to risk at, uh, enabling too many warning options that are going to break people's builds who compile with WR. But um, I'm not that nice, I guess. If I were <laughs> a compiler developer, I'd turn them all on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wonder, is there is there a, a way or a possibility of moving kind of warnings into the standard, you know, so you could say these are the standard set of warnings that all compilers should implement, and maybe they have a standard um, wording or a number system. Yeah, there was, who did we talk to about that? Patrice, briefly, or something? Possibly. About the possibility of something like that maybe someday happening, but I think you, it would take so much effort to get everyone to agree. But I think we have, we have two things right now that I think virtually everyone agrees on, that falling through switch conditions is maybe not something you want to do, and unused variables is something that maybe you want no, not, don't want to do. And so then we have um, the attributes in C++17 for those two things where we can selectively disable them when we want to. Mm -hmm. Hmm. But it's getting a consensus on what everyone agrees should be a warning, I'm guessing would be... Well, maybe you maybe should volunteer, tough. Josh, to spearhead that... <laughs> Ah, uh, I, you know, I guess it's not surprising that you say that. That makes sense, right? <laughs> if it's your idea, then... Um, that wasn't my yeah. idea. You said there should be a standard set of warnings. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> no, um, I'm sure other people have had the same idea. Maybe, maybe someone else will. Maybe I will. But I guess if there was at least maybe a framework in the standard for, like you said, maybe those two go in first, and that's easy because everyone agrees, and then you can incrementally pull in other ones. Yeah. I, I know... Uh, we can get into this later, but we, we have a tool that generates C++ code, and we work hard to have that be warning-free, right? which is really difficult across multiple compilers. You know, So we have to figure out, are we going to ignore certain warnings, or are we going to you know, pragma them out? Uh, anyway, so. Well, you know, I mean, uh, maybe we can talk about that briefly now, since you just brought it up. What what do you do? Like, do you, if you work with GCC and Clang, do you, what warning levels do you guys use? So uh, for the for the code that we that we generate, okay. So maybe maybe we'll back up real quick. So um, sure. 
the one of the the main tools I work on at Unity is called IL2 CPP, and that's something really we'll definitely dig name. into in a minute, right? Yes. Okay. But, but the idea is it, it converts .NET bytecode to C++ code. Okay. Um, and then we we try to do as best as we can have that C++ code compile without warnings. So we uh, in in our internal tests we turn on W error on GCC and Clang, and the I don't remember what the flag is on on Microsoft compilers, but the same flag. And then we go through and we disable maybe a half dozen warnings that we know that we, we have problems with. And okay. we kind of try to pick those off you know, over time. Um, because of the nature of some differences between the um, .NET runtime and the way IL works and the way C++ works, there are some kind of impedance mismatches that prevent us from turning off all the warnings. Okay. But, um, but the idea is basically in our test code we do that. And then... Uh, and our, for our users, they run the same tool, and then they'll compile it on their machine with a platform-specific compiler. Um, in that case, we don't apply W error. We okay. want it to compile even if there are still warnings on their machines. And that's to catch cases where we may be missing something in our test suite, like it's a bit of IL code that we don't have covered in our test suite yet. And so we'll generate a warning that we aren't expecting or something. Okay. We'll definitely have to dig into all of this a lot more in a minute. <laughs> Yeah, so let, let's back up a little bit and start out by telling us a little bit about your job at Uni 3D and kind of why you live in both the C Sharp and C++ world. Sure, so uh, so Unity Technologies is uh, you know, the company I work for, which makes the Unity 3D game engine. I think it's relatively well known by now. I think mm-hmm. we've been around for 10 or 15 years. I'm not sure exactly how long, but uh, in any case, the Unity 3D, the game engine is mostly written in C++. Uh, the scripting language exposed to users is C Sharp uh, and a few other languages we can talk about, but mainly C Sharp. And so things are built on top of a, a .NET uh, runtime. In the .NET world, there's a couple of different runtimes. Um, there's Microsoft's, they actually have a few, uh, and there's a pretty cool one called Mono, which is an open source project to implement a .NET runtime, a C Sharp compiler, uh, all these different tools that you need for a whole .NET environment and ecosystem. And that's been around almost since .NET has for Microsoft. Um, so Unity is a native application written in C++ that hosts the Mono runtime internally. And so then users can write c Sharp code. Um, we run the c Sharp compiler on that code, and then we execute that code with the Mono runtime inside the Unity application. And so the, the role of my team is to we maintain the integration with Mono, and we also work on new development in that area. So that involves you know, things like integrating the C-Sharp compiler into our toolchain and into our users' toolchain, uh, making sure the runtime works across all of the platforms Unity supports, which is a pretty large number. I think it's something like 20 or 30 now. Basically, oh, wow. any platform you can play a game on, um, you, can write, you, can, you can write a game in Unity for. Um, so we maintain that across those platforms. And then the other thing we've done is this thing we call IL to CPP, which, like I said earlier, translates IL bytecode. So that's kind of the, the stuff that dot, a dot .NET runtime executes. It translates that into C++, and then we compile that with a platform-specific compiler. And then we have an implementation of the .NET runtime, so the same thing that, that Mono does from the runtime side of things. Uh, we implemented that in C++, and then we can execute our generated C++ code and it uses our C++.NET runtime to make everything work. Uh, so, so my team you know, developed the IL to CPP technology, and we maintain it, and we maintain the mono integration with Unity. So maybe we should start off by, by talking a little bit about IL and kind of the differences mm-hmm. in what a C-sharp compiler produces and what a C++ compiler produces. Yeah, I think that makes sense. So when you, when you compile C-sharp code, you get this thing called IL, which I guess I should have mentioned that's called intermediate language. Mm-hmm. So it's a bytecode format. Um, a, lot of, a lot of languages have a similar bytecode format. I think Java does, and, and maybe some interpretive languages. I'm not entirely sure. But, but IL is uh, kind of like assembly. You can think of it like that. Uh, so it executes on top of a virtual machine. And the virtual machine is the often called the .NET virtual machine. It's... It's kind of like a real CPU, but without registers. So a lot of virtual machines operate like this. They're stack-based. So they have the concept of memory in the sense of a stack. So I can push and pop things onto a stack. And then I can call functions. Uh, I can do really simple flow control with go-tos. I can define types, structs, and classes, these kind of things. 
that's all that stuff works in IL. So C sharp compiler emits this IL, and then anybody who can execute that IL, anybody who implements a .NET framework, a .NET virtual machine, can run the IL. Uh, and there's kind of four big virtual machine implementations out there right now. So Microsoft has the .NET framework, which is kind of the classic one that's been around for a while. Um, they've recently built a new one called .NET Core. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's uh, fully open source and portable across, I think, Windows, Linux, and Mac, and maybe a few other platforms now. Uh, and then Mono, um, which is uh, the one that Unity uses. And then ILTA CPP, uh, the one that we developed internally. There might be others, but those are kind of the four biggest ones as far as like production use that I'm aware of. So... C++, of course, right, is different because the C++ compilers are, compilers are emitting machine code directly for whatever you know, operating system and architecture that you're compiling for. So I can imagine if you're a C-sharp developer, um, you're used to, I can compile this code down to what's called an assembly, which would be like a DLL or an executable in .NET. And that's just, that's an IL byte code. And I can take that assembly to any platform that supports .NET. I can okay. take the same assembly to you know Mac, Linux, Windows, any place that can execute .NET and execute it, and it theoretically should execute the same way if the .NET virtual machine is working properly. And of course, with C++, that's not possible. Um, one of the other cool things about IL from a developer perspective is it can be disassembled pretty easily. So there's a couple of utilities out there. One's called IL Spy, which is an open source project, and uh, JetBrains has one called DotPeak. Uh, and both these two utilities can take an IL assembly that was generated from a C-sharp compiler, or really from any compiler that supports IL, and you can fully inspect it. You can see all the IL code um, with pretty high fidelity. Hmm. So it'd be, it's interesting as a, if you're a C-sharp developer and you're thinking about, you know, I want to get involved in C++, right? Um, a big thing about C++ is being really close to the machine. Mm-hmm. You know. You can, you can often reason about how is my C++ code going to look like in the target machine language, you know. And, if, you know, you can use, like, Compiler Explorer or tools like that to really, you know, actually see that. Uh, it's a little more difficult to do that with C Sharp because you've got that .NET runtime, which is doing the actual conversion to machine code for you. But it is really easy in C Sharp to see the IL code. And if you can, you know, take your C Sharp assembly that you compiled, use one of these tools to disassemble it and look at the IL, I think that's really beneficial because you can see... You know, what constructs in C-sharp create a lot of IL, which ones, you know, create a small amount of IL. And, and really, if you can understand IL, you can understand most assembly languages. They're really similar. So I spent a little bit of time last year looking at the Java byte code generated by the Java compiler. And I was kind of surprised to notice that it did, like, no optimization at all. And it mm-hmm. seems to be that their argument is, well, the, uh, you know, the JIT will take care of that. I'm curious... How much of a is it like a one to one correlation from your C sharp to your IL, or does it do optimization like we would expect a C plus plus compiler to do? I think most C sharp compilers are not doing a whole lot of optimization. Okay, um, they're getting better. So Microsoft's compiler Roslyn is kind of their new compiler framework, uh, which is open source, and it does uh, more optimization than their their previous C sharp compilers did. But a lot of the work is still done by the runtime. Um, so Microsoft has a, a, a new JIT uh, run, or, okay, maybe I should back up. So um, the, an acronym JIT uh, is useful here. It's a just-in-time compiler. Right. That's how most mm-hmm. .NET, um, and I think, I'm not sure about Java, but I think Java is the same. But most .NET stuff works via JIT, right? The IL code is JITted, so it's compiled on the user's machine to machine code, kind of as it's executed. And then that that compiled binary is saved for the next time the same you know, function gets called or something it you reuse. It doesn't re-JIT. Right? So Microsoft has a, a pretty new JIT compiler for IL called RyuJIT, and uh, it does a lot of optimization. So the kind of things you'd expect in a C++ compiler to do, you know, the kind of things you see in Clang or GCC from different types of optimization passes, the JIT compiler does that. So I think in the end, the, the goal of the c Sharp compiler is to produce IL you know, that the JIT compiler can work with but okay. it's not doing a significant amount of optimization. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the main differences that uh, people think of between a managed language and, and C++? Uh, one of the big ones I know is memory management. is quite different between the two. Sure. So, so in C-sharp, we've got you know, garbage collection is the norm for memory management, right? So if you say, 
in C sharp, the syntax looks very similar to C++. I say, you know, new list of int or something like that, right? That's going to tell the C sharp compiler, hey, I want to create a new object and I want the garbage collector to manage that memory. So there's no, uh, no need in C sharp to deallocate or call free or delete or any of the things we see in C++ uh, because the garbage collector will track all the references to that memory and it'll remove the memory whenever it sees fit when nobody's referring to it anymore. Um, there's similar concepts between C sharp and C++ in the sense of the heap and the stack. So, you know, both languages have that capability to either allocate things on the stack, you know, just a, a small scope or a function scope or allocate things on the heap. Um, the difference with C++, of course, is when you say new, right, you get a heap allocation. It's up to the programmer to specifically free and deallocate that memory. Um, as a C-sharp developer, you know, you don't think too much about that in a lot of cases, right, because the GC handles it. But at least from the perspective of the code we see in Unity, that can matter uh, because the GC is non-deterministic. So if I'm doing a, a game or maybe even a server application where I need to have some sort of a response time guarantee, mm. um, the GC can really be a problem. Right. Um, now, the better the, the better the GC implementation is, the less of a chance that'll be a, you know, be an issue. But you can still get a non-deterministic you know, time where your application is stopped because the GC has to go do something. So there are ways in C-sharp to avoid garbage collection. Um, there's kind of two different categories of types, I guess is the best word in C-sharp. You have reference types and value types. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in C++ or C-sharp, something like an int or a double is a value type. Um, it's never allocated on the GC heap. You know, it's always allocated on the stack. Um, and then a class, a user-defined class, is a reference type, which is always allocated on the GC heap. And you have this kind of in-between type called a struct in C Sharp, which is a little different from C++. So creating a struct in C Sharp is a user-defined type, but by default, it's going to be allocated on the stack. And that gives you really you know, tight control of the memory then. If you want to write C Sharp code with structs and value types, you can use kind of scope-based memory management in a sense because you're not going to the garbage collector. Hmm. But if you're coming to, coming to C++ from C Sharp, um, you, know, you need to consider the fact that you have to do something to free that memory, right? And of course, in modern C++, C++ that's not calling new and delete, right? right? We want right. to pretty much avoid those. Um, if you're using, what, C++11, maybe C++14 or later, you know, unique pointer and shared pointer and all the tools you need are there. Um, in C++. So I think it's you know, certainly possible in modern C++ to avoid any manual memory management in most cases. So I'm thinking about from you know, a programmer, you know, what I'm thinking about as a programmer in C Sharp and C++, things are pretty similar. Right? If I'm using modern C++, I don't think about memory management too much as long as I use the right types. Okay. Uh, but I guess un behind the scenes there is a difference. I think, was it CPPCon last year, Herb Sutter did a talk about the, the um, memory management in C++. But it introduced yeah. new pointer types, that kind of thing, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I remember he had a slide or something with a table that was really excellent. It had, you know, if I want something to live this scope, I do this, and this scope, I do this, and it kind of broke it down really nicely Right. Um, for a developer. So I think if you're coming from a managed language, something like that would be really beneficial to kind of, kind of understand what are, the, what are the idioms in modern C++ for memory management that can avoid the need to, you know, have dangling pointers and and incorrectly freeing things or double freeze and all these kind of problems you can run into where you're doing kind of like more C-style memory management. So with IL to, C to CPP, you're taking the IL, you're recompiling it to C++, but you s so it has some sort of interoperable intermediate layer of some sort so that you can bridge these concepts. How does that work? So in the C++ code we generate for IL to CPP, does run in a garbage-collected environment. Uh -huh. So it's hmm. C++ code, but we actually are using a garbage collector in our runtime implementation. Okay. So the garbage collector is really, is really in the .NET runtime. So anytime somebody says in C-sharp new, um, that gets, there's a certain IL instruction, a single, you know, if you could call it an assembly instruction, one instruction in IL, which is a new object. And that's to say, create an object of this type from the GC. Okay. And so that goes to the runtime and says, GC, I need, you know, 40 bytes of space for this object. Give me back a pointer with 40 bytes of space. And any .NET runtime is going to have to do this. 
and then the, and then um, and then it's the job of the runtime and the GC to keep track of all the references to that thing and correctly garbage collect it. But out of CPP, although we're converting to C++ to get the code generation, um, we're still using a GC. So it's still a full .NET runtime. So did you actually, like, I'm, I'm, I'm now becoming, like, weirdly curious about what the actual generated C++ looks like. <laughs> did you, like, mm-hmm. make your own operator new and that kind of thing to, like, generate garbage collected pointers? Or are you using allocators? Or are you just doing something completely different, like some sort of library implementation? It's really in a library implementation. Okay. Um, there, there, there's a function that gets called in, into our runtime library, which you know, says, hey, I need, I need a new object of this size for the, from the GC. So it's not, a, not an overload of the operator new. Um, okay. So how do you and then, then, and then, yeah. Oh, I was just wondering how you keep track of lifetime and, and knowing that you know, things are referencing this thing that you just made. So that's, uh, that's where the, the garbage collector comes in. So right, right now we're using the, um, the BOEM GC, which is actually written in C, and uh, um, Hans Bohm, I guess, who's well known in the C plus plus community, uh, wrote it, and and it's still maintained. Uh, but it's a it's a what's called a conservative garbage collector. So that means that whenever it needs to run a garbage collection, it's going to have to stop all the threads in the program, and it's going to scan for things that are called GC root. So it builds a directed graph, basically, of all that memory accesses and all the relationships between objects that it knows about. And the GC roots are what determine what's alive and what's not. So we have the option of allocating specifically, say, this object is a GC root, and it's going to live for so long in the program. Uh, but it also locates GC roots by looking at the call stack for each thread. So it'll say, on this thread, you know, look through the call stack, find all of the local variables that are sitting on the stack, any of those that might be references to something which is GC memory, keep track of those. Uh, Okay. Yeah, so that's really that's really how that works, uh, and, and kind of how we implement the you know the .NET runtime. And different different runtimes and different garbage collectors have different ways to handle that. Okay. Uh, since we're talking about memory and garbage collection mm-hmm. right now, uh, maybe we could talk about the differences between constructors and destructors between the two languages, because I think that's another thing that uh, can be pretty different. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. So. So constructors are relatively similar. I mean, the constructor kind of sets up the invariance for your class or your type, right? The same way we in C Sharp and C++. And actually, it's interesting to kind of see as languages kind of cross-pollinate ideas, right? So C Sharp has had, I think they're called forwarding constructors maybe for a while, where one constructor can call another one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think C++ got that at C++11, which is a really nice feature for kind of organizing class initialization, especially if you want to provide you know, a different interface to initialize a class in different ways. Yeah. So in that respect, constructors are pretty similar. Uh, destructors are very different. So they're spelled the same way, right? If you look in code in C Sharp and C++, you see tilde, you know, type name or something, right? For both, both destructors, but they're totally different. Uh, in C Sharp, because it's garbage collected, there's no guarantee about when an object will be deallocated. Even if it's no longer referenced at the end of a function or when a class goes out of scope, the garbage collector may not have an opportunity to actually collect that memory you know, anytime soon. It's totally non-deterministic. So the way that works is there's the, the destructor, which is also called a finalizer in C Sharp sometimes, will get executed at some arbitrary time. Um, in some .NET runtimes, that's, that occurs on a background thread. So for Alta CPP on most platforms, um, we have a separate thread that runs that that calls finalizable objects and says, okay, the garbage collector is done with you. I can call your finalizer now. Call your destructor. Um, that means in C Sharp, you have to be really careful about what you put in a destructor. Um, you can't have references to any other objects that might be on the heap mm. because they may have been called before or after you. They're destructors. You don't know. Um, so you're really restricted. You know, where C++, because we have the scope-based you know, resolution in RAII, that resource acquisition is initialization. Yes. That, that acronym always is a confusing formula. But basically, right, when you exit a scope, the compiler is going to make sure that any types in that scope have the destructors called at a deterministic point, right? Yes. So they, as soon as you leave that scope, they're called, and they're called in a certain order, I think based on the order they were declared. Reverse in that order, scope. yeah. So, so it's, it's really deterministic. So the key thing is that difference in determinism. So in C++, you know, I can have more freedom in a destructor. I guess still not total freedom, right? We don't want to do things like throw from destructors. And sure. 
ugly things like that. But I can have a lot more freedom into structure because I can know and I can reason about in the code when they'll be called. So in C Sharp, I can't do that. So I think for most C Sharp programmers, you know, I've learned at least that you really don't want to put any code in a finalizer or a destructor unless absolutely necessary. That's always like a last, last resort. And, and I know I've been bitten by four by putting code in there and, you know, bugs come up because, oh, I didn't think it'd be called in this case or in this, at this time or something like that. I mean, in, no. in C Sharp, yeah. what code would you put in a destructor if you have no idea when it's going to execute? It's, it's really tough. Sometimes it'll be, a lot of times if it's objects that have a, a native or an OS level thing kind of behind the scenes, they have to manage like a file or a thread or a socket or something, something in the OS level that's not part of the managed language system you'd put there. So if you're all working in a managed code, yeah, you almost never write a destructor. But once you start calling into, you know, pick up these things that don't work with the C sharp GC, you may need to say, <clears throat> if I have a wrapper class that manages a file, for instance, like I need to make sure that when the finalizer is called, if the file handle is still open, it gets closed. So, so I don't leak it. Um, that's probably the thing I've seen, I've seen that in most, yeah, in most cases, something like that. But the, the one thing that is in C sharp, which is similar to a C plus plus destructor is the, this interface called I disposable. So you can, it has one method called dispose and that's kind of a cleanup method similar to what a C plus plus destructor does. So if you're running C sharp code, you can use a pattern with a, the using keyword, which basically says I'm going to use this object, and this object has to implement I disposable. And then when we get, it's an open curly brace, then a bunch of code. And at the closing curly brace, the dispose method will be called. Hmm. So you get something like RAII uh, in C Sharp. So if you're a C Sharp developer, I'm guessing you might be familiar with that pattern <clears throat> with using an I disposable, and you know that you could, in your mind, that's very similar to what C++ destructors do whole concept of languages when I, I don't know when something's going to be destructed it just makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> it, can be, it can be really scary, yeah. And when, when you get to working between C-sharp and C++ or working C-sharp with these you know, OS concepts that don't fit into the GC, it can become, you know, there's some, there's some uh, odd kind of bugs that can happen there. Right. I wanted to interrupt this discussion for just a moment to bring you a word from our sponsors. Backtrace is a debugging platform that improves software quality, reliability, and support by bringing deep introspection and automation throughout the software error lifecycle. Spend less time debugging and reduce your mean time to resolution by using the first and only platform to combine symbolic debugging, error aggregation, and state analysis. At the time of error, Backtrace jumps into action, capturing detailed dumps of application and environmental state. Backtrace then performs automated analysis on process memory and executable code to classify errors and highlight important signals such as heap corruption, malware, and much more. This data is aggregated and archived in a centralized object store, providing your team a single system to investigate errors across your environments. Join industry leaders like Fastly, Message Systems, and AppNexus that use Backtrace to modernize their debugging infrastructure. It's free to try, minutes to set up, fully featured with no commitment necessary. Check them out at backtrace.io slash cppcast. Since you brought up uh, just now the two of them working with each other, what are some of the ways uh, C Sharp and C++ can inter interoperate? Well, usually they interoperate, like like a lot of languages, through the C um, ABI, because mm. C++ doesn't have a stable um, ABI across compilers. So there's a, a method called pinvoke or platform invoke, which I think was originally designed in C Sharp to access the Win32 API, which is a C API. Uh, but it can really be used for any, any function that can be exposed as a C function. So you can define an extern function in C Sharp and then apply some attributes to, to it to tell the runtime, hey, this function maps to some native function in a given DLL or shared object of a given name. And what happens then, whenever, whenever the, the runtime, the C Sharp runtime sees that method called, then you can... Uh, It'll say, oh, go look up that native function in that DLL, you know, get a function pointer to it, and invoke that function pointer with the arguments. And then the arguments have to be mapped or marshaled, as it's called, from managed code into native code. So, for example, a string in C Sharp, most runtimes represent a string as um, an integer, which is the length of the string, followed by UTF-16 encoded two-byte characters to make up the content of the string. Okay. Uh, and when you go to a C or C++ function with a string as an argument, that has to be uh, copied into 
you know, a char star basically. And they'll allocate the runtime will allocate a buffer for that. It'll copy all the characters, do a conversion to, you know, I guess ASCII or UTF eight, and then provide a pointer to the native code with that same variable in it. That same data. So so what happens there is uh, all the parameters and the return type have to be marshaled. Uh, one kind of interesting caveat that we see a lot in that case is, for example, functions returning bool make a lot of sense, right? You might want to call into native code or native library and ask you know, a question, right? It returns a bool. Well, in C-sharp, a bool is marshaled as a four-byte integer because the capital B-O-O-L type in Win32 API is four bytes. Hmm. Okay. Uh, but in C++, of course, a bool is one byte, right? Probably, yeah. So I guess maybe it doesn't have to be. Yeah, I don't believe there's a requirement, but yes. Most implementations we've seen have one byte. So I make a function call to a native method, which returns me a bool, and everything works great. And now I turn on optimizations in my C++ build, and uh-oh, now like, you know, that, that extra three bytes that in the, you know, in the debug build, there was nothing was used there, and it happened to be zero or something that worked out. Now that's used by something else, and we get the wrong return value. So we have to explicitly tell the, the, the C Sharp or the .NET runtime, hey, this is a bool return value. I want you to treat this as a one byte unsigned value because otherwise you're going to treat it as a four byte unsigned value. So, so when you go from interop from C Sharp to C++, you kind of get these sort of odd uh, little characteristics sometimes. And, and uh, you can hit performance problems if you're going across that boundary a lot because marshalling can be expensive to allocate and deallocate memory on a regular basis. Uh, and you can do the same thing in reverse. So you can take a C-sharp function, and there's a, a method in the, in the .NET standard library you can call to get a function pointer to it, a C function pointer. Oh. And then you can pass that C function pointer to native code somewhere in C or C++, and you could wrap it in a std function or you know, whatever, you're, whatever you're doing in, in C++ or native code, and then you can call it later. And when you execute that function, there's a little wrapper around it that the .NET runtime has created, which will say, oh, I see this is a managed method you're calling. So I'm going to marshal all the parameters back from native code to managed code. So again, if you had a char star on that argument list, it would allocate some managed memory with the GC, um, build up a, a managed string, and then pass that managed string into the managed method that you asked to execute. This all sounds so can, very expensive. It, it really is. It really is. Usually... <laughs> The pattern that we see for this kind of thing is if you have some sort of a native library where you have a high performance, you know, something that you can implement in native code much faster than you can implement in managed code, right? And you want to give it a bunch of data. Mm-hmm. You say, okay, I'm going to give this, this native method some sort of data which is uh, blittable, meaning that we can just do a direct memory copy right. from managed to native code, so a big, you know, a big array of bytes or something like that. Let's say I want to... I want to you know, render something, and I have to give it to a native rendering code from C-sharp. So I can give it a big array of bytes, and it does the work for me and then returns. Um, so anything that's kind of a chatty interface, where you're going back and forth across this boundary pretty often, is usually really expensive. And the .NET runtime is going to do a lot of work to kind of make that all happen that you probably don't see in the code immediately. Um, so, so yeah, but it's really beneficial, right? If you have... You know, code that's in both managed and native code, or you're transitioning from one to the other, you know, in a section of code, the ability to interoperate between them is, is you know, absolutely necessary. Right. Okay, so now I'm curious about IL to CPP again. We've mm-hmm. talked about these costs, and we've talked about jitting, and now I'm wondering what the motivation was for making your own .NET runtime with the C++ translation. So the motivation was twofold. First of all, uh, the biggest one is probably portability, and then a secondary one was performance. Uh, so because we support so many platforms at Unity, we're always looking for ways to make our code more portable, right? Like the less work we have to do to bring up a new platform, the faster we can get it to our users, the you know, faster they can make games in it. Okay. That's really important to us. Um, <clears throat> IELTS CPP is slightly different from the .NET Framework and .NET Core and even parts of Mono because it's not a JIT. It's an AOT compiler ahead of time. Mm-hmm. So IELTS CPP does not allow for runtime code execution like you would get in .NET. In .NET, I can actually say, you know, in C Sharp, I can, I can create a method inside code and then say, okay, go execute this method, right? IELTS CPP doesn't support that. It's only ahead of time compilation. Okay. Uh, so with that in mind, basically IELTS CPP is converting IL code to C++, but really what we're looking for is IL code to machine code for lots of platforms. That's the idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, so... 
one of the nice things about Mono, one of the reasons that Unity uses it, is Mono has an AOT engine as well. So Mono can take I.O. code, can AOT it, and get machine code directly out without going through a .NET, um, without jitting through a .NET runtime. Okay. This is really useful for platforms like uh, iOS and a lot of console platforms where, where runtime code execution is not allowed. Hmm. You know, the vendors or the operating systems don't prevent this. So PlayStation 4, Xbox One, you know, all these, all these platforms are AOT only. You have to have pre-compiled code. Uh, so the portability aspect was this. If, if we wanted to bring up a new platform at Unity, uh, we had to have a person who understood the architecture of the platform, the OS of the platform, uh, assembly language for the platform, and the way that Mono's AOT engine works. Okay. So finding developers with that skill set is really difficult. And even ones who are really good at that would be, you know, basically months to bring up a new platform sometimes. There's a lot of work there. So by taking the IL code and converting it to C++, now we have this representation of the code C++, which really works well because it can... Every platform that we have already has a C++ compiler. Usually those C++ compilers are really good at generating code. They can generate efficient code. Um, they can usually generate better than you know, handwritten code that someone could write into an AOT engine because they've got you know, years and years of developer time put into them to generate efficient code. So really it came down to portability. So we've taken our time to you know, port uh, our scripting engine to a new platform from maybe months to weeks. Wow. Uh, okay. Using Alba CPP, so basically it means if I'm going to port to a new platform, I need to um, do some backend code to make sure that the, the there's the C++ runtime section of Alba CPP. We call it lib Alba CPP, which is actually just normal C++ code that developers write that runs on the on the target platform. That has to be implemented for you know the target APIs, right? Sockets, files, threads, mutexes, all these kind of primitives need to exist, and someone has to implement those. That's not not too much code though. But then all of the I.O. code that we have to uh, actually, you know, AOT down to the machine level from the standard library and from all the user code, that's always the same C++ code across all platforms. All the CPP generates, you know, platform invariant code, basically. So that gives us a nice portability win um, whenever we have to bring up a new platform. And then we do get, on some platforms, better AOT code, better machine code output, because, like I said, the C++ compilers are usually pretty good at that. Um, we can pick up wins in a few other places. Um, we've had benefits where um, the mono AOT had to use double um, for floating point calculations, and Unity is mainly a float engine. So we're getting you know really over precision sometimes, and so some floating point scenarios, out of CPP generates faster code. Okay. Um, but but the real the real main focus was on portability um, and the ability to bring up new platforms faster. I'm wondering if it does it at all ease this difficulty in the interoperation between C++ and C-sharp code that we were just discussing? So it really doesn't, actually, which is kind of odd. Um, I thought that it would when I first started here and started working on this. Oh, this is going to be really easy, right? We're emitting C++ code, but the, it, it doesn't make it a whole lot easier because the, even though we're emitting C++ code, that C++ code is really just in... You can think of it as an intermediate representation for machine code. I mean, that's what it's going to be. Right. And so it still has to follow all the same rules that the machine code has to follow eventually as far as marshalling of parameters and return values and making sure that things are correctly hooked up to the, you know, the managed runtime that we talked about. So the interesting thing, though, is whenever you, whenever you look at the C++ code that's generated by Alda CPP for these marshalling cases and these p-invoke cases, you can actually see written in code the cost of it. You can see, oh, look, I have to iterate over all of the strings in this array, and I have to allocate code for each one, and I have to allocate uh, memory for the array, and I have to copy them all, okay. and now I make the function call. And now I come back out of the function call, and this marshalling scenario may be one of the changes that were made in native code to be available in managed code, so now I have to iterate the array again, reallocate new you know, entries, copy all the data, and back over. Whereas you know, when you're just looking at machine code, that's really hard to see. Right. But it actually does not make the interop better in a sense of performance. There's all the same work has to be done. Okay. Uh, but you did, um, you did say that one of the motivations for IALTA CPP is performance, but the main motivation mm -hmm. is portability. So yes. is the generated C++ still something that the C++ compiler can optimize, or is it something that it's like, I have no idea what you're doing here? 
you know, the, the C++ compilers do a really great job of optimizing it. I was kind of, you know, I've been worried about that in the past. Okay. But um, they seem to do really well on pretty much every platform we've seen. Um, since IL has no flow control, uh, everything's go-tos, so the generated C++ code really is, it's really IL that's, con- you know, transpiled. Right. Basically, so you end up with go-tos all over the place, right? There's no loops. Um, you know, there's some ifs, that's about it. But the C++ compilers do a really good job. And one of the, one of the, one of the ways that we benefit is we can, we can kind of control how much C++ code is in a translation unit and what goes where. So we can really get some nice benefits out of inlining, especially without link time optimization. So, you know, LTO is really nice when you're getting to a final product, right? Especially for, you know, something that's high performance like a game. But for iterating and development time, LTO can be really difficult because it t- take a long time to do link time optimization. Um, so one of the things that we do is try to group together managed code that executes in the same places, like in the same types, into the same translation units. And we'll generate really big translation units, maybe like 50, 60,000 lines of C++ code. Okay. Um, and so that gives the compiler a lot to chew on for inlining, for example. Right. So we get, uh, on most of the compilers we have, pretty much all of them, we get pretty good optimization. And we're very happy with, with the resulting the machine code that we get out. That's very interesting. So IL to CPP works with the, the C Sharp Unity scripts uh, for Unity mm-hmm. games. Could a, you know, just Windows C Sharp developer write an app and, and choose to compile it with IL to CPP instead of the, you know, visual C Sharp compiler and, and get some benefit out of that? N- not easily. Okay. I mean, theoretically, it's possible, right? We can we can convert uh, pretty much any any. IO code that came from a C-sharp compiler. We could convert, but uh, we don't really have it packaged or available like that. Okay. Um, internally for testing, we do some things like that, but um, it, our focus is really on you know the Unity customers and not on a general .dot at runtime necessarily. So it's not available in that respect. Although maybe someday, I don't know. Okay. It's only technically possible. So why did um, Unity choose to use C-sharp as a scripting language? So that's a tough question that kind of extends back before my time at Unity. Okay. Um, I think way back when it was just the founders. I think it may have been Python, actually. Um, that's but at a some point, terrible language for embedding. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't, I don't know the te- technical details, but I think at some point it was C Sharp and .NET were chosen. I think a lot of it had to do with Mono being an open source project. Um, and at this point, you know, I've been, like I said, ten or fifteen years on with Unity. Um, you know, we're really happy with that decision to use C-sharp uh, because the C-sharp ecosystem has really blossomed, especially in the last maybe three to five years with Microsoft open sourcing a lot of things and, and really taking a renewed focus on it. I mean, the C-sharp ecosystem is pretty big. There's a lot of tools out there uh, that, that really make it easy for developers to work in C-sharp, so we like that. Um, and uh, one of the things that, that we, like to, we like to push at Unity is, you know, we try to make... I try to solve hard problems. We try to make hard problems easy for users. Um, and so C Sharp provides us with a nice framework to do that because uh, there's flexibility in things like the reflection capabilities, um, you know, the jitting capabilities we can use in a lot of cases. Um, we can kind of help users and guide them and protect them um, so that they can focus on making a game and not worry about, you know, as I think our, um, our CTO said in a recent talk, you know, the last thing we want is you to be have this game ready to go, and two days before it's released, you find some random crash, you know, that you can't track down, right? That's, that's, we've, we've done something wrong if that happens, and the Unity side. So, so our goal is to, you know, make it as easy as possible. And C Sharp provides a lot of safety, and, and more safety than you get out of C++, I think, in that respect. Right. Um, so that's really nice. But, uh, yeah, where, why it actually originally started, I'm not entirely sure. I think it probably had to do with the, the fact that Mono was open source and was a, a product that was available that worked well. Right. Now, I feel like I should clarify just in case I get some hate mail for saying that Python would be a terrible language to embed. (laughs) The Python interpreter was never designed for embedding. And if you really want to dig into it, you can look into something called the global interpreter lock, and it just makes things difficult. But anyhow. (laughs) And and that makes sense, too. That might also go into why Mono was was chosen in C-sharp. Mono was kind of from the beginning, I think, designed for embedding. Yeah, like I, it can be run standalone, and it has a really nice embedding API. So we can, from Unity, we can call and get access to all of the Mono VM internals um, from C and C++ with with very little friction. 
I've never used mono specifically, but it's easy for me to believe since it was, you know, the same group of people that, you know, liked having a Lisp interpreter and Emacs kind of thing, you know, so it's uh, a lot of GNU guys that were working on it. Yeah, it's pretty, it's, it's a really a great technology. I mean, you look at all the things that they've done, um, it's pretty incredible, actually, to, you know, fully re-implement the .NET, you know, ecosystem, basically, in an open source way. Yeah, that's cool. Is Xamarin also based on Mono? Yeah, so yeah. Xamarin is, uh, uh, well, was a company, and Xamarin, I guess, is a product now, too, which is, like, using the Mono project for mobile development. Right. Um, but Xamarin was recently acquired by Microsoft. So from a company perspective, it's part of Microsoft, but there's still the Xamarin, iOS, and Android, and maybe a few other products out there. Um, going back to Unity and the scripting languages, uh, you also support JavaScript, right? Do, does JavaScript do yeah. anything with IELTS CPP? So it does. Um, we support JavaScript and a language called Boo, okay. um, which I think is maybe short for Bamboo. Um, but one caveat, the JavaScript is not really JavaScript. It's more like air quotes JavaScript. Um, we actually call it Unity Script internally. Okay. Uh, so at one point, maybe years ago, it was JavaScript. Um, but it was the, the way that JavaScript and Unity, or I'll call it Unity Script just to be clear, the way that Unity Script works is it's actually built on top of this bamboo language, this boo language. So the boo compiler actually interprets the Unity Script code and then generates IL code, which we run on the .NET runtime. Oh, okay. That's a little bit, a little bit out there, right? Um, so the, the couple levels there. But the, the issue was that as JavaScript evolved, Unity Script did not evolve with it. So J- U- Unity Script is kind of like a snapshot of JavaScript, maybe at some point in time. Um, but we do still support it, although we're kind of phasing out support for it now because this the C Sharp ecosystem has continued to really evolve, and C Sharp as a language has grown. There's some some new features of C Sharp, especially in C Sharp Seven, that we want to use in the Unity APIs. And we can't get support for those in Unity Script without significant work um, from our side. Uh, and we think it's better to kind of standardize on one language. So, so over the next couple of releases of the Unity 3D game engine, we'll be phasing out Unity Script support. We actually have some teams working on tools that will convert Unity Script code to C Sharp code because there's a lot of user code out there that still is using Unity Script. And, you know, we want to make sure that those users are supported. So good. it's still a possibility... Hmm? Sounds like an impressive undertaking, effectively yeah. converting JavaScript to C Sharp. Yeah, it's it's. I'm not involved in that, but it does <laughs> it does sound like a lot of fun. I think it, I think it's it'll work. But we have we have a team working on it now, and and that's the the plan is that uh, Unity Script will be phased out. So it's still possible to use right now. But the relationship to IELTS to CPP is that in the bottom line is Unity Script is compiled onto IL, so IELTS to CPP will convert it then without really caring a whole lot about what the original language was. Cool. So that's the benefit of .NET and IL in general. You can write multiple languages on top of, you know, this same IL infrastructure and kind of share the, the runtime. Right. You know, and we haven't talked much about the other .NET framework languages, but there's also F Sharp and, and mm-hmm. NVB.NET, right? W- would they mm-hmm. also be able to compile down to IL and run through IL to CPP? Uh, parts of them can. Um, those aren't officially supported by Unity. We've done some work with F Sharp um, kind of internally uh, to make it work, but there's some parts of it that are really difficult to implement and require kind of significant work in the runtime. Uh, I know that Mono, for instance, supports all of that, and um, you know they put a lot of effort into that. So it's something that, since they're not officially supported by Unity, we've not supported an to CPP. Uh, but, uh, but a lot of the code that you'd get out of VB or F Sharp would work. But uh, it's not something that you should try as a developer, I don't think, because unfortunately, if you submit a bug report to Unity, we'll have to say, well, we don't officially support that, so gotcha. we probably can't fix it. Okay. Uh, before we let you go, um, do you want to just tell us a little bit more about Unity and maybe getting into game development? Is this something that uh, an indie developer can pick up and try out for free? Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. The whole Unity product is available. Um, you can get all of our platforms that we support um, for free. Uh, I think there's a a cap on the yearly revenue or something like that, $100,000. I don't know what it is now. Maybe it's more. But, um, but yeah, you can download it and try it, and I really recommend it. So, you know, I mentioned one of the things that we try to do is solve hard problems, right? Another kind of key tenet for Unity is uh, democratization of game development. You know, the idea is to make it that anybody who wants to make a game can. Um, now, I really 
you know, since working in the games industry for the past few years, I've come to a, a great respect for game developers because it's not an easy task. I mean, balancing coding, artwork, sound effects, you know, performance optimization, you know, understanding different devices and architectures. There's really a lot there. Right. And, uh, you know, and then not even counting like backend things like servers and analytics and um, all these things you need to need to make a successful game. Uh, it's pretty amazing how people do it. But uh, yeah, anyone who wants to get started, unity3d.com is the website. They can download it and, uh, and give it a try. Um, well, and since we're talking to a bunch of C++ developers here, we talked about using Unity Script and C Sharp for effectively writing your Unity game. Can we use C++ mm-hmm. to write a game with Unity also? Yeah, it's possible. Okay. Um, Unity, the Unity API does not, is not available in C Sharp, so you're going to be restricted on what you can do. You mean but not available in you know, C++? A number of, Sorry. <laughs> ah, thank you. Yes, you're right. I <laughs> got mixed up. Yes. Yeah, not available in C++. So the API is only available in C Sharp. So places where you need to interact with Unity, you have to use C Sharp. But, uh, you know, it's not uncommon for games to have significant parts of their code that are native code, even with Unity. Okay. Oh. Um, so if you're looking for, you know, something where, where you want to write it in native code, um, you know, that's certainly possible. Now, one of the kind of cool things that we have coming up on the horizon, which I'm not directly involved in, but... Um, but I've, I've seen it at our conferences and whatnot is, is kind of a, uh, mm, what's the best way to describe it? It's a, it's kind of a new idea for thinking about high performance code in C sharp. So the idea is to take the garbage collector out of the equation, provide uh, native like memory management. So I can say, I want, you know, arrays and lists and sets of memory, which is contiguous mm-hmm. and really take a data oriented design view okay. so that I can. I can, I can set up all my memory the way I want. I don't have to worry about the GC putting it in a different place or moving it or anything like that. I set it up how I want. I can now spread out my computations and my tasks across you know, many different threads or cores on a machine and kind of do this all from C Sharp. Right. Hmm. Um, so it's kind of, kind of our goal is to say, you know, like we, can, we can get you know, as good or better performance than we can with native languages in some respects. So um, you can do so that that's coming down the line. I think maybe in the next Unity release or the next one after that. Um, but it'd be something to check out, especially if you're a developer working on you know in native code for performance. Okay, you know, it might be a trade off. You want to take a look at it. Do I get you know as good a performance in a managed language? Maybe I get a little more safety, or do I want to stick with a native language where I'm closer to the machine? But uh, you know, I may have a little bit a little bit more that I have to manage on my own. So okay. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Josh. Uh, where can people find you online? Uh, my blog is joshpeterson.github.io and uh, petersonjm1 on Twitter. And, uh, and also check out the Unity 3D blog. Um, we've got a lot of content up there for game developers. Uh, about two years ago, I did a series about uh, IELTS CPP internals. So if you're interested in seeing how the C++ code gets generated and some of the things we discussed, it's there. And there's another kind of mini-series that we did about... Um, a few optimizations that the Alta CPP plus uh, transpiler makes. Now it doesn't do many, but it does a few things to try to optimize the code based on the knowledge it has. So yeah. this might be something to take a look at if you're interested. Cool. Great. Thanks so much for your time today. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thanks so much for listening in as we chat about C plus plus. I'd love to hear what you think of the podcast. Please let me know if we're discussing the stuff you're interested in, or if you have a suggestion for a topic, I'd love to hear about that too. You can email all your thoughts to feedback at cppcast.com. I'd also appreciate if you like cppcast on Facebook and follow cppcast on Twitter. You can also follow me at Rob W. Irving and Jason at LeftKiss on Twitter. And of course, you can find all that info and the show notes on the podcast website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode is provided by podcastthemes.com. This website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode is provided by podcastthemes.com.